passion that hides behind masks. Beauty, mystery, and lavish celebrations. The glory of courtly splendor. It is the attitude to life of an epoch called Rococo. It is a time which elegance can get you far. A time in which one gains the highest influence if one knows how to impress. With alchemy, with flattery, or with business sophistication. The man who is constantly on the run, pursued by the secret police, but who always manages to escape authorities. The man who is considered the greatest seducer of all times. In old age, he takes stock. While revolutions and wars destroy the old order of Europe, he writes a monumental work, The History of My Life. He is the last witness of a sensual epoch in decline. What is the secret to his art of seduction? and to his art of surviving. Giacomo Casanova. Giacomo Casanova, the most famous Venetian. What does this man have that others don't? A master in the art of living and a daredevil. A brilliant entertainer a free spirit who revolutionizes the love between a man and a woman. To this day, his womanizing skills are mythical. He became famous for his memoirs. He works on them for 12 years to alleviate his loneliness and old age. On more than 3,000 pages, he describes his dramatic life. Nobody has described his time in more detail than he has. No one has staged his life so sensuously in literature and no one is loved so intensely. In the end, all he has left are his memories. His life begins in Venice in 1725. He is only eight years old when his father dies. His mother is an actress, coveted and glamorous, celebrated on the stages of Europe. But he will miss her too, because she is constantly on tour, leaving little Giacomo in Venice. Venice, the ancient lagoon city. He'll be shaped by it, just like his grandmother, who barely keeps the sickly boy alive. Constant nosebleeds weaken the child's body. After all, Grandma can only think of one last thing. Casanova's first memory is a traumatic experience. My grandmother calls me into a gondola and takes me to the island of Murano. There, a witch is waiting for us. The witch opens a box, puts me inside, and tells me not to be afraid, which of course scares me even more. I'm still bleeding. I hear laughing, crying, singing, screaming, and knocking on the box in turns. Finally, they get me out of the box. The bleeding has stopped. The witch predicts a fairy will visit me in the coming night. I can't talk to anyone about any of this or I'll die. For Casanova, this is a kind of initiation ritual, a kind of second birth. He was with this witch, which he certainly experienced as a kind of healing being, and I think that also had a very strong influence on his image of women. It influenced him to the extent that he had experienced that there is no need to be afraid of women, but of course it also influenced him in that he has experienced that people can be manipulated, that he had been manipulated himself for the first time, and he learned that people are gullible. And of course, he carried that with him into his later life. The boy is cured. He develops his skills playfully. He learns to read and write in no time. His grandmother finances a classical education in the university town of Padua. He is extremely talented and inquisitive. He also learns to play the violin early, as well as to improvise. But there's something else in his teacher's house that fascinates Casanova. My teacher had a younger sister, Bettina. 
I liked her right away, but I didn't know why. She kindled the spark of passion in my heart, which was to dominate me later. Casanova, for the first time, falls madly in love with Bettina, who is four years older. But Bettina rejects him. She already has a lover. This is certainly a great disappointment for Casanova. But on the other hand, it also shows his great affection. Because when she falls ill with smallpox, he cares for her lovingly. And 50 years later, he sits on her deathbed. And it turns out that Casanova is not only a seducer, but he is affectionate. He is loving. Venice, 1742. His hometown becomes the first big stage for the now highly educated young man who returns from his studies in Padua. He begins his ecclesiastical career. It's the only chance for a poor actor's child to really rise. And he shows great talent at his first sermon. Casanova inspires. Even love letters from enchanted ladies end up in the begging bowl. Casanova enjoys the protection of a rich patron, Senator Alvis Gasparo Malapiero, the confidant of his mother. He resides in one of the oldest palaces on the Grand Canal. There, the young Casanova gets the opportunity to learn manners and test his seduction skills. It's the first time he ever really brings disaster upon himself. He falls in love with the lover of his aging patron. In his memoirs, he calls it anatomical explorations of the girl's body. But the owner of the house is unhappy with so much medical interest. This expulsion by his patron makes Casanova destitute, but he will keep risking everything for passion. He must leave Venice and try his luck somewhere else. I have always relied on divine providence, he says retrospectively. He shares his carriage with a lawyer on a business trip to Rome. He immediately likes the lawyer's wife, Lucrezia. A trip in a carriage offers passengers many opportunities to get closer to one another. What begins as a fling on this journey will become one of Casanova's greatest love stories. Rome, the holy city, the power center of the world's largest religious community. Casanova even succeeds in being admitted to the Pope in the hope for employment, and with an extraordinary request. I asked the Pope's permission to read all the forbidden books. He gave them to me with his blessing. Casanova becomes secretary to the mighty churchman Aquaviva, but without adhering to the associated rules. Casanova is ready to put everything at risk once again for his freshly rused love for Lucrezia, this time his promising career in the Vatican. It's a very spicy liaison. He has also made friends with a lawyer, even though the latter suspects that Casanova is courting his wife. <laughs> Casanova becomes the family's constant companion. During the sociable excursions to the countryside, he finds many opportunities to inconspicuously get away with his beloved. Nine months later, she has a child. From her husband or Giacomo Casanova? The daughter is christened Giacomina. Casanova has crossed the line not only with his love for Lucrezia, he is now also suspected of having seduced a cardinal's mistress. It's a scandal. It's the end of his great ecclesiastical career. 
I see his leaving Rome as a tactical and strategic decision because it was possibly clear to him that he would become too constrained, that his church career would have been too narrow a corset for him to actually be able to live his desire for freedom, his pleasure principle. Spring 1746, Casanova goes back to Venice without any money or friends. As a simple violinist in theaters and salons, he makes his mark. Again, it is a coincidence that he knows how to seize a moment that will radically change his life. In passing, a rich Venetian drops a letter. Casanova chases after the stranger. When the man suddenly collapses, Casanova senses his chance. He jumps to his rescue and watches over his sickbed for days. Now he even assumes the role of a personal physician. With success, because the patient sees Casanova as his lifesaver and opens his house to him in gratitude. The rich stranger is no less than Senator Matteo Bragadin. He comes from one of the oldest families in Venice. Bragadin introduces him to his wealthy friends, two bachelors whose passion for occult sciences Casanova knows how to tend to. He makes an impression on the two gentlemen with his sophisticated appearance, his extraordinary education, and the aura of the initiated, which he exudes. These are all elements of his art of seduction. They don't only work on women. They are interested in Casanova's remarks on alchemy and astrology, but they don't realize that Casanova is a clever imposter. The improvisation artist is full of ideas and always has a formula or horoscope ready, which inspires his new friends. Casanova has a sixth sense to anticipate the wishes of other people. Casanova makes people feel as if they themselves came up with what he suggests to them. Casanova's plan works. His patron, Bragadin, equips him with a luxury gondola, a servant, and a generous annuity. But there are those envious people who want to see him as an heirloom. And in Venice, slandering is made easy. Everywhere there are letterboxes with the inscription for secret denunciations. The Inquisition is omnipresent. It's the best intelligence service at the time, and Casanova will become its victim. Even in old age, he remembers that he was accused of desecrating corpses. I was granted 24 hours notice, after which I was threatened with arrest. Under these circumstances, Signor Bragadin told me to better avoid the storm. Everything settles down in Venice once the city has forgotten a story. And Casanova does get away to Paris. In an inn, he meets a mysterious soldier who reveals himself to him as a woman. For Casanova, it's a challenge to fathom her role play. She allows herself to be seduced, but she keeps her secret. He had never met a woman so passionately combined with spirit and sensuality. They feel like soulmates. Casanova knows nothing of her heritage, but he suspects that she must come from a distinguished family. She takes off her soldier's uniform, but it is important to her to remain incognito. She has Casanova call her Henriette. She greatly fears being discovered. She doesn't tell her new lover why. The beautiful stranger will be the great love of his life. I spent three months with her in the same infatuation and was always happy. Until the day Casanova wishes to proudly present her to the world. 
Initially, it's a complete success. His beautiful conquest is admired by everyone. But she fears to be recognized by one of those present, someone who knows about her secret. She is a member of a French noble family and fled from her violent husband. Her escape is a scandal that has spread all over the country. She is an unusually emancipated woman for that time. Casanova realizes he is going to lose her. With her appearance, she challenges her fate. And so it happens. She is recognized and decides to return to her family. She cuts her farewell words into a window pane. You will always forget Henriette. No, I have not forgotten her, and it is always balm for my heart when I remember her. When I consider that now in my old age I find my happiness above all in the living memory, then I realize that my long life has probably brought me more happiness than misfortune. How strange love is. It is a kind of madness over which philosophy has no power, a disease that can affect people of any age and that is incurable when it attacks you in old age. Henriette was Casanova's great love. He found in her this perhaps rare connection between mind and body, being able to enjoy and to think. And it was very, very important to him that a woman could enjoy herself because he wanted to satisfy the woman, to make them happy, and he knew how. And he managed to do that both physically and emotionally, and that made him a very special man. And I think maybe he's the one we're all looking for today. Paris at that time is the cultural capital of Europe. This is where the intellectual and artistic elite of the era gather to present themselves at the extravagant festivals at the court of Louis XV. But Paris is also the capital of love for sale. The morals of 18th century noble society are flexible. The act of love then was of little more importance than eating and drinking. You sleep with each other and then walk away without obligation. Once Casanova reminds the lady of the night they had just spent together. She's surprised. I remember you very well, but folly does not give us the right to know each other. Today, it is always so important for women to be emotional and in love. First comes love, then the sex. Back then, in Casanova's time, things were perhaps a little more relaxed, not so taboo. Back then, it was permitted to smell, taste, and have sex just for sex's sake. And Casanova had elevated this, one might say, to an art form while showing emotion. But now, Casanova feels like he's missing something. He has conquered Paris for himself, but after two years of debauchery, the Italian returns home to Venice, his old place of longing. Does he still have to fear pursuit by the secret police? His old patron Bragadin calms him down. His case is time barred. But Casanova has not been forgotten by the envious. An informant is appointed to trail him. His reports have been preserved to this day and provide official information about Casanova's activities. It says that he is a gambler and knows many foreigners, that he frequents the homes of many girls, married women, and women of other kinds, that it had always been his way of life to live at the expense of others and win over gullible people, that Casanova thinks that those who believe in Jesus Christ are morons. When you get to know him, 
You see him in unbelief, lies, fornication, and lust, united in a way that arouses revulsion. So much for the informant's report. Are these accusations completely untrue? Perhaps not, because he says of himself, there was no worse rake in Venice than me. And as if he wants to prove this, he falls in love with the beautiful Cece, whose true name he does not reveal in his memoirs. He promises her marriage. When her father hears about this, he sends her to a monastery. This was a popular way of keeping one's virginal daughters safe. This gives many daughters the opportunity for erotic adventures far away from the family. As for Cece, who is seduced by her friend, who offers her lover a spicy spectacle. He is no less than Francois de Bernis, ambassador of France to Venice. The secret meetings take place outside the monastery in the ambassador's luxury villa. A good connection for Casanova, which will pay off later on. It is strictly forbidden for the citizens of Venice to socialize with foreign diplomats, but Casanova and the Frenchmen ignore this law. Casanova feels untouchable. Does he really think the secret police won't find out? The informant's reports on Casanova's activities provide the state inquisitor with enough incriminating material. Casanova's, Casanova's claim to freedom was carried by his idea of involability. He always imagined a world in between. The thought that the Inquisition could ever reach him did not even exist in his imagination. And this was a suppressed risk that stimulated him, on the other hand. Is it the pleasure of exhausting the game to the very end? Does the trait that makes him a great seducer also make him a victim of himself, his hubris? On the morning of July 26, 1755, the chief of police presents him personally with a subpoena which will abruptly change Casanova's life. But not even now does he realize the gravity of the situation. He'll probably be back from interrogation by noon. He believes that his eloquence will also help him through his threatening situation. A dire mistake. He is locked up in the attic of the Doge's palace, the notorious lead chambers, so-called because the roof is covered with lead plates. Bitterly cold in winter, unbearably hot in summer. The prominent prisoner is given small amenities, soap, books, writing materials, even some wine. And with a few zucchinos, even the jailer can be won over. But the hardest punishment for Casanova is his boredom and loneliness and his uncertainty of whether he will ever leave this shed alive. Even though they're called lead chambers, the ceilings of the cells are made of wood. With a finger-thick iron splinter, he scratches through the planks for months. Persistence is also a characteristic of the seducer. His escape is cleverly planned. Casanova chooses early morning on All Saints' Day to escape because he knows that the prison guard will sleep off his hangover on this feast day. In his silk dresses, he can pass himself off as a leftover guest in the Doge's palace. In fact, the night watchman willingly opens the door for him. After 15 months, he is finally free. But he has to leave his beloved hometown behind and will not see it again for a long time. 
For Casanova, this was basically the worst thing that could have happened to him, to be banned from the city for almost two decades. Casanova called Venice a cruel mother, but he always longed to return and did everything he could to come back to Venice and experience this wonderful city and this combination of water and sea, of beauty and tradition. Casanova once again flees to Paris. He has old acquaintances there. The carefree life in the city's gardens has hardly changed just like before, like five years ago. For the escaped convict, his return is a triumph. An old friend, Sylvia Belletti, the most famous actress in France, has already introduced Casanova to the city's high society on his first visit. Casanova is a welcome entertainer in a society for which pleasure and intrigue is the only purpose in life. With the story of his spectacular escape, he captivates his listeners for hours, claiming to be the only one who has ever managed to escape from the terrible dungeons of the lead chambers. He could always tell about this escape from the lead chambers. They asked him to tell what it was like. And he could portray himself, invent himself, so to speak, as an enlightened man who had succeeded in escaping from prison and overcoming state inquisition. But as exciting as the stories Casanova tells are, they don't make him rich. Casanova has the same problem as the French king, lack of money. But he has an idea, and also the right man in the right place. The ambassador with whom he once seduced nuns in Venice is now foreign minister at the court of Versailles. Monsieur. Casanova's plan is as shady as it is ingenious. Casanova à votre service. And he is given the opportunity to present it to the ministers of the court of Louis XV. His money-making machine is based on a fail-safe principle, the principle of hope. With the hope of profit, hundreds of thousands of subjects could be induced to voluntarily fill the state coffers. You just have to tell them that a lottery ticket is the chance of a lifetime. He has created a probability calculation that shows how the state can only win through gambling. The concept is convincing. Hope and faith have always been good seducers. What Casanova doesn't say is that he knows the idea of the lottery from Genoa, and he copied the prize schedule from an Italian mathematician. But Casanova is still considered to be the inventor of the French state lottery until today. He makes millions himself. His success makes him very popular with the powerful in France. And the most powerful person in France is a woman, Madame Pompadour. She is the mistress of Louis XV and has her own ballet company a reservoir for every new playmates for the king. But she also has far-reaching political plans. Casanova offers himself to Madame Pompadour as a mediator for her ambitious projects. With a mixture of power consciousness, business sense, and eroticism, Pompadour essentially determines politics. Casanova, the master of so many roles, meets this challenge. He hopes to win her over, too. Casanova was a master of psychological reflections. Therefore, Casanova's encounter with Pompadour was a challenge for him. On the one hand, facing a desirable lady, and on the other hand, offering himself as a mediator in a highly explosive matter for her. And this ambiguity, this walking of parallel worlds, was, so to speak, decisive during those times. You didn't have to deal with the ego, the super ego, and the guilt. One lived amorally, but not immorally. 
The era seems to have been perfect for seducers and charlatans. Casanova's next coup is a staging in the world of superstition. He approaches the then richest woman in France, the Marquise de Ufer. She is known for her passionate interest in esoteric knowledge. She has her own alchemist laboratory to this end. The imposter smells easy prey. But there are other charlatans who want to challenge him. Cagliostro's self-proclaimed count from Palermo. He claims to own the philosopher's stone and to be able to make gold. He and his wife are considered the most cunning pair of schemers of the 18th century. The biggest charlatan and Casanova's arch rival is Saint Germain. He claims to be over 300 years old and to have been present when America was discovered. He claims the ability to show his customers their future. Casanova fears tough competition from the two of them. He has to come up with something exclusive to get to the Countess's fortune, especially since Casanova has already spent the millions he made with the lottery. For this, he needs an extraordinary tale of lies and a young girl. He finds her at the side of his younger brother, Gaetano, who has fled Venice with his lover and suddenly seeks his help. In contrast to Casanova, the brother has only become a priest and is considered a failure by Casanova throughout his life. Gaetano disagrees with Casanova's attempts to make a pass at his girlfriend, Marcolina, much to his disadvantage. Marcolina will serve as his muse in an extraordinary ritual. Madame de Uffer has set her mind on being reborn a man. Only as a man could she become immortal. Casanova knows what to do. She has to sleep with him three times. She will give birth to a son in whom her soul will live on. A young girl must be present as a mediator during the sacred act, and as Casanova later admits, to give him the necessary excitement for the strenuous ritual. 48-year-old Du Ufer waits in vain for her pregnancy, but Casanova makes off with her fortune. When I left, I took with me her soul, her heart, her spirit, and all that was left of her common sense. Later, he justifies himself. One must begin with deceit in order to get reason on the path of truth. The Countess is still waiting for Casanova's promise to come true when she receives a letter from one of his adversaries. Casanova is a sorcerer, a traitor, a fraud, an imposter, and the most criminal of all men. Casanova's reputation has been destroyed, and he is even threatened with expulsion from France. Casanova's ups and downs in life show the restlessness of a player who constantly reinvents himself in the acceleration of the moment. With the scammed money from De Ufer, he leaves for London. Here, too, Casanova socializes in the salons of fine society and understands how to stage himself as a dandy. Here, Casanova meets an extraordinary and dangerous woman, Marianne Charpillon. She's a much sought after beauty for sale. For sale only at a reasonable price and also very choosy. Casanova has not yet lost his lust for the game of seduction. However, the seducer is already approaching 40. She will put his art of seduction to his toughest test. Chapillon is like a reflection of Casanova. She also is a perfect seductress. Refined, greedy, scheming. 
she accepts his many gifts. He spends huge sums of his fortune on her. She lures him with promises, but keeps on stalling. His desire to possess her becomes obsessive. Casanova is beside himself. No woman has ever rejected him like that before. And he has never been so desperate in his whole life. But he knows how to get even. Chapillon, Chapillon is a worse whore than her mother. The talking cockatoo becomes a sensation for passers-by in front of the London Stock Exchange, where Casanova offers it for sale. Decades later, he is still appalled by his behavior towards Charpillon. He had never been violent with a woman before. His charm had always triumphed. What had happened? Had he become too old? In his despair, he had even been on the verge of jumping off a bridge into the River Thames. The great seducer at the end of the line? Casanova, Casanova and suicide. That's actually an unacceptable paradox because one does not imagine that someone who deals so psychotechnically with love suddenly despairs of love. And it would be interesting to think that Casanova was narcissistically offended by the rejection and therefore weary of life, not out of existential despair par excellence. Casanova would have every reason for existential despair. He is to be brought to justice in London for forgery of checks. He faces the death penalty. Again, he has to go on a journey to build a new existence. His next destination, Potsdam, the summer residence of Frederick the Great, Sansushi. Here, he hopes to find a position that would free him from his financial worries forever. Within three days, he manages to get an audience with old Fritz, Casanova recalls. It was the first conversation I had with a king. It felt as if I was playing a scene in an Italian comedy where the actor has to improvise and if he gets stuck, is immediately booed out. So I arranged my face in dignified folds and replied to the proud ruler, I could talk about the theory of tax. When we arrived at a round temple with a double row of columns, he stopped in front of me, looked at me from head to toe, and after a few seconds said, you know, you are a very beautiful man. Frederick the Great offers him a job as a teacher. What an imposition. He, Casanova, a teacher at a cadet school? He will try his luck in other European capitals. Will his charm prevail once more? Or should his star really be fading? Once more, he regains his old form. The opera in Warsaw. Casanova is there at the personal invitation of the Polish king. When visiting a premiere, a dispute about the prima donna, a former lover of Casanova, arises. A count, her current admirer, is offended by Casanova. He challenges him to a duel. Casanova is not afraid. He sees this as an opportunity. Being challenged to a duel by a count means being recognized as an equal by him. He will risk his life for that. Giacomo Casanova the son of an actor from Venice, could soon feel a nobleman. The Count is badly wounded, but proves to be a gentleman. He asks Casanova to flee. Dueling is forbidden in Poland. He must fear expulsion by the Polish king, or worse still, the revenge of his relatives. The Count survives, and Casanova flees Poland. 
I remembered my sufferings and my joys. I found that I was to blame for all of my own misfortunes, that I had abused every favor of fate. Whether happy or unhappy, life is the only treasure man possesses, and he who does not love it is not worthy of it. For another 20 years, Casanova travels all over Europe. He dabbles at being a theater director, author, publisher, and also occasionally a spy on behalf of the Inquisition of his hometown, Venice. Casanova's last stop, Du Castle in Bohemia in today's Czech Republic. At the age of 60, he finally finds a permanent position as a librarian in the house of Count Waldstein. Unloved by the servants who see Casanova as a vain parasite, a relic from the past, he works here for 13 years. Casanova has lost everything, wealth, charm, the recognition of young women. What does he possess left in old age? The memory through words by writing the story of my life, These memories are the only remedy I had at my disposal. So as to not go mad or die of grief, I wrote them out. Casanova, Casanova is not the chronicler of his life when he writes his memoirs, but he develops a broad panorama of society during his time in order to find himself within this public sphere again. Casanova's secret? Through the many roles he has played in his life, he stayed himself while being empathetic, in that he has given us hope to be able to unify love and freedom. He dies in 1798 at the age of 73 and is buried in the cemetery of Deux. His grave is forgotten. But his memory lives on as the beloved seducer, the artist of life, the seeker of happiness, the most brilliant chronicler of an epoch in decline, but ahead of his time with his legacy. Existence is delicious. You just have to have the courage to live your own life. <laughs>